This is a new day. This is a new season. And I really believe that the Lord wants to do something absolutely amazing in your life, in your family, in your home. Precious Heavenly Father, we just welcome your presence in our lives, in our homes, and we ask God that you just flood it with your glory, with your goodness, and Lord, with the revelation of your Son, Jesus. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. Holy Spirit, unfold. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear the goodness of God's Word, and may it be implanted in, in our hearts, in the soil of our hearts, and bring forth good and lasting fruit. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Speaking of Jesus, that's our series, and we're on part two of Jesus, the identity of Jesus. And today, the subtitle is going to be The Son of God and the Son of Man. The Son of God and the Son of Man, Jesus. From the very beginning of this series, I said, the better we know Him, the Lord, the better we know ourselves. That's the urgent reason for this focus, to know Jesus. If our faith is not whole, then we live lives that are not whole. Not because God wills it to be that way, but a partial or half revelation of Christ. It's a dangerous faith. Why? Because we allow something other than the truth to make up the rest of the story, to make up what's needed. Partial truth mixed with fabrication is still 100% lie. Andrew Murray, the prolific author and pastor, once asked this question in his book, The Practice of God's Presence. He asked, what is the reason for the weak spiritual lives of so many Christians? Each believer needs the full revelation of a personal Christ as an indwelling Lord. Man, that's an amazing, an amazing statement. Do you have a full revelation of a personal Christ in you? Do a little reverse engineering and ask yourself, am I gentle beyond my own capability? <laughs> I know some of you are laughing right now. That's Jesus, the Lamb of God on the inside of you. Are you bold as a lion beyond your own courage or personality? That's the line of the tribe of Judah in and through you as Jesus. And if these attributes and characteristics aren't there, don't worry. Don't make excuses, but don't worry and fret. Christ in you is able to do this life work as you know him more and more, better and better. It's a common thing to not like what we see in ourselves, especially when we see it through others' eyes in an uncensored moment. Sebastian Maniscalco, he once said this, one of my biggest pet peeves is when a guy's wearing flip-flops, which I don't understand. Men's feet are disgusting to begin with, but now they're on display when I go to a restaurant. I have to sit there and look at some guy's hoof? I don't get it. <laughs> you got to hear him say it. Flip-flop or not, we all desperately need a revelation of Jesus, the real Jesus, not a culturally convenient Jesus. We started out this series discovering that he is the lion and the lamb. The unfathomable range of his character and person is so dynamic that he is the lamb that was slain, and at the same instant, he is the king of all kings, triumphant, royal, and mighty. Praise God. He had to be silent going to the cross so we wouldn't activate 80,000 angels. You can read that in Matthew 26, 53. To diminish our understanding of who Jesus is jeopardizes our faith in what he can do. That means if you only see him as an unfortunate historic victim of Roman brutality, you miss the risen savior of the world who has conquered death in the grave. Now you may be young and feeling like you'll never die, so what does eternity matter? Well, it does. You might be 83, feeling like you missed your opportunity. It would be hypocritical to change my beliefs now. No, absolutely not. It's not too late, and you don't insult God when you decide to believe on His Son, Jesus. You honor the Creator of life when you repent, change your mind, turn on your faith to believe on His only begotten Son. Believing on the Son honors the Father. St. Augustine once said this, God chooses us not because we believe, but that we may believe. Consider this, we all needed to be rescued from our sins. Our enemy isn't just without. My friend, our enemy is within. 
Humanity is its own worst enemy. Jesus had to condescend so low that he needed to be the lamb going to the slaughter, sacrifice himself to save us from our sin, iniquity, disease, and the invisible curse woven into every chromosome of our cellular makeup. We needed the lamb, but we also need the lion, a champion to defend us, to conquer our enemies, provide for us, give us diplomatic immunity. Look at this in Ephesians 4 verse 10. He who descended is the same as he who also has ascended high above all the heavens that he, his presence might fill all things, the whole universe from the lowest to the highest. As I said in part one, he is one Lord with these two extreme dynamic spectrums of character. And that's exactly what we are going to further explore in this session. As we pursue the person of Jesus in this series, let's expand our understanding of him as the Son of God and the Son of Man. You heard me right. This is going to be like nothing you've ever heard before in your traditional religious forums. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. More accurately, he is the only begotten Son of God. That distinction is very important because God has a big family. Jesus came to make many, many sons and daughters of God. That was his assignment. Oh, I know you've heard that Jesus came to forgive us of all of our sins, but God, he could have done that from heaven without an earthly visit. The truth is God had to come to earth in the form of man in the guise of sinful flesh, the Bible describes it, so that he could redeem us. That's an important word. That means to get us back to the original design, the original order, and the original place. Forgiveness alone is not redemption. Jesus redeemed us. Pam and I have dear friends, Bob and Audrey Meisner, wonderful people. When we were first married, they came to us with broken hearts and told us that their marriage was in deep crisis because of infidelity. They had three kids already, but to make things even more complicated, Audrey was now pregnant from the affair, from the adultery. There was a lot of crying, a lot of anger, deep hurt, a lot of sadness. But when it was all said and done, Jesus not only led the way to forgiveness for them, but more. He led them to what seemed even more impossible, restoration, redemption. The love of God got them so back on track that their friendship blossomed. Their romance was better than before. They now travel the world counseling other couples in crisis and doing marriage conferences for people. Jesus can redeem us from the curse. In Luke chapter 1, the archangel Gabriel, he appears to the Virgin Mary on assignment to deliver her a message from God. He tells her that she's highly favored above all the women. And then he says this in Luke 1, starting at verse 31. You will become pregnant. <laughs> oh, what, a, what an announcement to a young woman. You will become pregnant and you will give birth to a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his forefather, David. Talking about King David. Verse 33, And he will reign over the house of Jacob throughout the ages, and of his reign there will be no end. So he tells his teenage girl who's a virgin that she's going to give birth to the Son of God who will sit on an eternal throne throughout all ages with no end to his reign. Does that sound good, Mary? <laughs> she quickly asked the obvious question. Well, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel replies, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the holy sinless offspring which shall be born of you will be called the Son of God. Oh, well, that sounds reasonable, right? Mary got pregnant with the word of God. In fact, when she answered the angel, she said this, let it be to me according to God's word. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning, before all time, was the word, Christ. And the word was with God, and the word was God himself. Jesus is God's word. So before he was incarnate, 
in the flesh, he was fully the Son of God. The Word of God has been from the very beginning of time. The plan initiated by God's love to save humanity is manifest in the Son of God coming to earth as the Son of Man, Christ Jesus. This is amazing. Think of the humility of the Creator to put Himself in human form. Let's look at it. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9 who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained, but stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant in that he became like men and was born a human being. And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross." Therefore, God has highly exalted him and has freely bestowed on him the name that is above every name. My friend, that name, Jesus, is above every other identity. It's the immortal passcode for all of eternity. Why do men curse that name and not others? You think about it for a second. Look at God's love expressed in this act. Jesus strips himself of all privilege and dignity to take on human form so he can be son of man. Perfect, without sin, but qualified as a human to take all of our sins to the cross. God couldn't pay for your sins as God. He had given mankind all dominion over all the earth in Genesis 1, and then Adam, the first man, gave it all away with his act of treason, disobeying God's word in the Garden of Eden. Humanity was now out of sync with the word of God, God's Son. The sin of Adam brought a curse on man that concluded in the death of man. God created humanity, but humanity gave itself away to a destroyer, a thief, a spiritual con man called the devil. God wants to save mankind, but what a ridiculous predicament. Man is man's problem. It's kind of like this. What if someone you dearly loved had a terrible disease? The deeper you love that person, the more you hate that disease. Isn't that right? You would do anything to kill that disease, but at the same time, how do you save the person you love while executing the disease? That's the difficult puzzle our medical world strives with day after day after day. Now amplify that problem by a million times a million with the problem being the curse, the sin disease how to solve this. Look at John 3, verses 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him, Jesus, shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send the son into the world in order to judge the world, but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him, through Jesus. God sent Jesus to make you safe and sound, your family safe and sound, not to judge or hurt you or condemn you. Now that's love. Remember what I said at the beginning of this Jesus series? Humanity's greatest ignorance is of itself. In other words, what you don't know is killing you. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Willie Nelson once said this, cruelty is all out of ignorance. If you knew what was in store for you, you wouldn't hurt anybody because whatever you do comes back much more forceful than you send it out. Look, even good old Willie knew a little bit about God's law of reciprocity. I just hope he knows Jesus. To know Jesus is to know God's word is to finally know you. I'm so excited to share this profound truth about you, your design, the genius of who you are. So let's do a quick travel through time to the very beginning of humanity. Now the beginning of humans is not the beginning of creation. The Bible makes that clear, so don't get your carbon dating all messed up. This isn't religion. Jesus came to give us God's kingdom, and there is no comparison. Religion is man's search for God. The kingdom of Christ is God's finding man. So this scripture is the first mention about your design in the whole Bible. This is a big deal. This is about you. Genesis 1, 
starting at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth. Look at that word, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image and likeness of God. He created him male and female. He created them. Now, that word for man here is not a single person, but a species of man, mankind. It's the Hebrew word ish, which is plural for species. It's not a gender specific. It's the species of man. In fact, verse 27 says it's the species of man, both male and female. You heard that. Then it says man is made in the image of God. And John 4, 24 says that God is spirit. That word image doesn't mean appearance because after all, God is a spirit. He's invisible. What it means is after God's character, his essential nature, his morality, you're designed as a copy of the God kind of spirit. You are both created and made. Two distinct Hebrew words. To be created is to come from nothing. To be made is to come from something. You, my friend, are a synthesis of the creator, pulling from his own character, his nature, his attributes, plus his unlimited imagination for life and being. That's you. Man, what a design. Now remember, this species man is made in the image and likeness. That word likeness is another Hebrew word meaning designed to function like God. When Romans 3.10 says that there is no one righteous, none that understands, the author was talking about our sinful ignorance of our true design, our function. Ignorance of God's word is ignorance of our function. Therefore, we are ultimately, <laughs> you got it, dysfunctional. Take a look around and tell me how plain that is to see. We all desperately need a redeemer to get us back into our true design, Jesus. This is getting interesting now, right? So God created the species of spirit beings in his image called man or mankind, male and female, man. So the first thing God gave us was not a purpose, but an identity to be like him, like him in nature and character. This is so important because look what comes next, our purpose. God then says, let them have dominion. Now that means complete rule over what? Over all the earth, not each other, but over all the earth. I hope you're seeing this. God gave mankind his character before he ever gave us power. Now, without the character of God, we are dysfunctional and we misuse power to rule over people. This is why we have so many leaders using positions abusively. They have no character to master their own fears and insecurities, so they abuse power. History has a way of showcasing this foolishness of mankind, doesn't it? Albert Einstein once said this, two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. That was kind of witty. I'd like to clarify what he said there about our stupidity. And it's basically us when we're in a dysfunctional state without God, without Christ in us. Okay, so where do our physical bodies come from? We see where our image comes from, where our likeness comes from, but what about the body, the physical body? You see, you are a spirit and you live in a body. I always smile when I hear someone say, you know, that they have a spirit. No, you don't have a spirit. You have a body, but you are a spirit of the God class. Now let's look at the next chapter after six days of creation and the seventh day when God rested. Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Wait, wait a sec here. I thought the species of man already existed from Genesis 1. Yes, but not in bodily form on earth yet. And here's why this is so important. For any spirit being to be operating on earth, they must be in a body. A body made of dirt is like a license for a spirit to be on earth. The word humus means dirt. Regardless of the color of your skin, your body is made of dirt. Red, yellow, black, white, brown. It doesn't matter what color. Your body is still dirt. From dirt 
you came and then back to dirt you go. Your body will anyway. So never chase an identity built around your dirt. Don't do it. It'll always be an empty fraud going nowhere. Your identity comes from who you are as a spirit being. We all live in a humus, a body of dirt. Now, when you combine God's image, the species of man, with the word for dirt, you get this, humus man. Humus man, or as we commonly know it, human. Human. We are this amazing, complicated synthesis of God's image living in these dirt bodies. God said this in Genesis 1, verse 26. He said, let us make man in our image. And then he said, let us give man dominion over the earth. Now, you understand better why a loving God can't just make everything better here on earth in spite of man. God has limited his access to earth by his word. His relationship with earth must be through his envoys, mankind. That's you. God cannot lie. He gave man dominion over the earth. He gave you dominion over the earth. Mankind is the legal authority here, and God does nothing on earth without partnering with his established legal authority. That's why the devil thought he had God over a barrel when Satan tricked Adam into surrendering his dominion over to him. Adam couldn't get it back because he was a debtor to the power of darkness. The devil could rule the world through a sin-controlled proxy, mankind. Oh, if only there was another, maybe a better, a new kind of Adam to come along. If only, if only. Oh, wait a second. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Christ, became a life-giving spirit, restoring the dead to life. What? There is another Adam? Jesus, the last Adam. You see, we were made to rule, but we played the fool, right? Sin entered humanity through one man, Adam. So God sent his son in the form of flesh as the son of man to legally get us back rule of the earth. The sinless last Adam dies on the cross for all of our sins. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus. Romans 5 verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace and the free gift of righteousness reign as kings in life through the one man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Jesus offered up his humus, his body for us on the cross. We know that from Hebrews 10, verse 5. Hence, when he, Christ, entered into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but instead you have made ready, look at this, a body for me to offer, a humus for me to offer. Look at this in John 1, verse 14. And the word Christ became flesh, human, incarnate, and tabernacled, fixed his tent, talking about his body, of his flesh, lived a while among us. See, here's the straight math. The Word of God, also known as the Son of God, took on human form by becoming the Son of Man. Sinless, but still the Son of Man. Now, he could legally pay for all the sins of the children of man so that we could in turn become the children of God by having faith in him, in his perfect sacrifice on the cross. Faith in Christ Jesus, the son of God, the son of man. One of my most favorite scriptures is this. Listen to this. John 1 verse 12. But to as many as did receive and welcome Jesus, God gave the authority, the power, the privilege, the right to become the children of God. That is to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name, his identity. What name? The name of Jesus, the identity of Jesus. Maybe you have a mind constructed about Jesus that limits him to being either son of God or son of man, but not both. The two are not mutually exclusive. In other words, both attributes of Jesus are essential to the matrix that makes him our savior and makes him our king. We need him to be entirely who he is to save us, to redeem us, to give us eternal life. 
the death of Jesus, paying the full price to redeem us, but also the resurrected Jesus on the throne of God, enforcing his amazing grace plan for each one of us. Why would you love part of Jesus and despise the other part of him? James says when we're double-minded like that, we can't receive anything from God. Do you find your faith, your prayers limping, maybe hesitating, kind of stalling under the doubt and the condemnation? Don't let those voices master you or accuse you any longer. You're loved by God the Father. You're loved by God the Son. We all need to be encouraged to see Jesus for who he really is. So don't be discouraged. You're on the right track, my friend. Let the Holy Spirit imprint this truth on your heart and you'll never, never be the same again. The better we know Jesus, the better we know who we are, the better we know our destiny and the keys to the blessed kingdom of God for this good life. And that's why God sent Jesus. Let's pray together. Jesus, I believe in you. You are the Son of God and the Son of Man. You are the sole expression of God's glory. You took on yourself the form of humanity, doing good for people everywhere. And then they took you and crucified you. You died on the cross for me. Three days later, God raised you up from the grave. You reign now for eternity. One day, you're coming back again. You are my Lord and Savior. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.